Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Ancient Gladiator School. Advancing technology is leading to more hidden and unexpected archaeological discoveries than ever before. In early 2014, a team of archaeologists led by Wolfgang Neubauer of the University of Vienna announced the discovery of a Roman gladiator school, or ludus, buried at the Carnuntum dig site located along the Danube River near the Austrian capital. Although excavations were carried out at Carnuntum for over a century by then, this particular find was made using remote sensing techniques. The large school, which consists of a building complex surrounding a courtyard occupies a 30,138 square foot area. Built during the 2nd century, the facility once boasted cell blocks, baths, and a training arena. The most prominent feature inside the courtyard is a freestanding circular structure 19 meters in diameter which could be interpreted as the training arena for the gladiators, researchers wrote in a study published in the journal Antiquity. Ground-penetrating radar also detected evidence indicating that the arena was once filled with wooden spectator stands arranged atop a stone foundation. The southern barracks had large cell blocks measuring between 32 and 75 square feet, while the western wing consisted of spacious rooms, which were likely well-decorated and probably belonged to instructors and or high-ranking gladiators. The school's owner, or lanista, also lived on site. Experts are using the data yielded from non-invasive techniques to develop 3D renditions of the site, offering a rare glimpse into the daily lives of gladiator trainees. World War II Explosives In late 2013, a pair of construction workers in downtown Belgrade, Serbia, discovered an unexploded World War II-era bomb, 20 feet below the ground, where it had spent roughly 70 years sitting beneath the city streets. The one-ton weapon was manufactured in Germany and contained over 1,360 pounds of explosives. To ensure resident safety, locals were evacuated from the area while the bomb was excavated and transported 44 miles away to a military base, where it was slated to be safely destroyed. Tesla also got a surprise when they uncovered seven unexploded bombs from World War II at their new Giga factory outside of Berlin. The factory will be making Model Y cars as well as batteries, battery packs, and powertrains. It's the machine that builds the machine. The bombs were dropped by the U.S. Air Force during the war. Munitions experts in Germany have safely defused the bombs, and Tesla is now free to continue getting the factory ready for 2021. Mud Dragon In late 2016, researchers announced the discovery of the Mud Dragon, a 66 to 72 million year old dinosaur uncovered by a farmer and a team of construction workers in southern China's Jiangxi province. The parrot like, sheep sized creature presumably perished in an exhausting, losing battle against swamp mud, hence its nickname, but researchers are admittedly unsure of how it died. More importantly, the mud dragon offers clues about what life was like during the late Cretaceous era, shortly before the mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs around 65.5 million years ago. Telemosis was a flightless species that is thought to hail from the oviraptorosaur feathered dinosaur group, whose name means egg-stealing lizards. These creatures were toothless, feathered, and non-avian. In other words, they were not birds. The mud dragon's demise came when an asteroid crashed into Earth on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, wiping out nearly all of the life on Earth in what became known as the Cretaceous Tertiary, or KT, extinction event. If you saw it alive, you would just think it was a weird bird, paleontologist Stephen Broussat told The Guardian. It looked like it got trapped in mud, and that's how it died. Unfortunately, the unexpected way in which the dinosaur was discovered means that it was partially obliterated by TNT. Still, the salvageable remains stand to teach experts about what the ecosystem was like shortly before the dinosaurs were wiped out of existence. Medieval Well Plymouth, England resident Colin Steer and his wife Vanessa had always wondered why their living room floor dipped in a specific spot beneath their sofa. They first noticed the indent shortly after moving into the home, when Mr. Steer was replacing the floor joists. I dug down about one foot and saw that it was a well, but my wife just wanted me to cover it back up because we had three children running around at the time, Steer told the Daily Mail. Probably a good idea since you don't want any of them to fall in. I always wanted to dig it out to see if I could find a pot of gold at the bottom, so when I retired at the end of last year, that's what I did, he said. He had spent over two decades trying to convince Vanessa to let him further explore the uneven floor. Finally, in 2016, Steer decided to get to the bottom of things, literally. And with his reluctant wife's blessing and the help of a friend, he began digging. Beneath the floor was a 33-foot deep, 30-inch wide medieval well that dates back to the 16th century, according to site plans. 
Roughly five feet down, the men found an old sword. It looks like an old peasant's fighting weapon because it appears to be made up of bits of metal all knocked together, Sears said. Fascinated with his discoveries and with plans to continue exploring and tearing up the house, the man cleaned up the well, installed lighting, and built a trap door over it. Vanessa remained unenthused, telling reporters, I hate the well, but I suppose it is quite a feature. When we come to sell the house, I just hope it's not a white elephant in the room. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments below. Mayan Mural While doing some home renovations in 2007, a family in Chahul, Guatemala discovered an ancient Mayan mural beneath layers of paint in their kitchen. Homeowner Lucas Asicona Ramirez noticed the centuries-old artwork after he began chipping away at the plaster, eventually uncovering the entire multi-wall piece, which depicts figures wearing a combination of traditional Maya and Spanish garb. Archaeologist Jaroslav Zralka, who revealed the find to National Geographic in 2012, explained that the discovery marked the first time in centuries that the mural was exposed to light. The figures in the paintings, some of who are possibly holding human hearts in their hands, may represent a so-called conquest dance, according to Boston University archaeologist William Saturno. A conquest dance is a special ceremony that is still performed today, demonstrating the Spanish invasion of the region and the Maya's conversion to Christianity. While it's amazing the mural survived for so long, given the rarity of these types of artifacts, the paintings quickly began fading from exposure, and experts raced against the clock to learn as much about them as possible. Ramirez's house, which is estimated to be at least 300 years old, was likely once the residence of an important person. Unfortunately, the history of the artwork and the home's previous occupants remains largely a mystery. Ground Zero Ship In July 2010, archaeologists monitoring excavations at Ground Zero, the site of the World Trade Center tragedy in New York City, discovered something quite unexpected underneath, a ship's hull at the site, buried 22 feet underground. Researchers spent the next several years untangling the mystery of the hull and the ship it belonged to, including when and where it came from. Initial findings indicated that the hull dated back to the 18th century, and archaeologists theorized that it was deliberately sunk during the early 19th century as part of an effort to expand Manhattan's land area with man-made terrain. Roughly one-third of today's Lower Manhattan was constructed this way, according to archaeologist Molly McDonald from the AKRF Environmental Engineering Company, who spoke with CNN shortly after the discovery. Prior to 1797, the location where the ship's hull was found was part of the Hudson River and was roughly half the size of the modern-day Ground Zero site. In 2014, scientists announced that they had finally solved the mystery of the ship's hull, which sat buried for over two centuries before it was found. Experts from the Tree Ring Research Laboratory at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory traced the wreckage back to colonial-era Philadelphia. An old-growth forest in the Philadelphia area supplied the white oak used in the ship's frame, a statement from the scientists explained, adding that the trees were probably cut sometime around 1773, shortly before the American Revolution. Using a process called dendroprovenancing, the researchers analyzed tree rings from wood samples to determine the ship's origin. Samples of the vessel's wood matched up best with late 18th century trees in eastern Pennsylvania, in the greater Philadelphia area. The trees used for building the ship were also likely used for constructing Philadelphia's Independence Hall, where the founding father signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Catherine de' Medici's Hairpin A four-inch long gold hairpin that once belonged to Queen Catherine de' Medici turned up in a most unusual spot a communal toilet at Fountain Blue Palace. Archaeologists discovered the hairpin while excavating the Henry IV courtyard at the former royal residence outside of Paris. Catherine de' Medici was married to King Henry II and was Queen of France between 1547 and 1559 when her husband passed away. She was known for her lavish jewelry, yet very little of it survives, making the hairpin discovery a significant one. The piece is identifiable as belonging to Catherine because it bears a monogram of interlocking C's, much like the famous Chanel brand symbol, which she used when she was the Dauphine of France, meaning she was married to the prospective heir from 1536 to 1547. The hairpin also bears evidence of Catherine's trademark colors in the form of traces of a white and green finish near the monogram. 
Among Catherine's surviving pieces of jewelry, only a few come from before she was widowed, further bolstering the hairpin's importance. Moreover, the latrine that it was found in was also an unexpected discovery, made during a routine excavation to ensure nothing of historic value would be destroyed during a planned construction project. Boy, did they get a surprise! Roman Villa in the UK In 2016, homeowner Luke Irwin was laying some electrical cables in his garden when he came upon something extraordinary. Digging in his barn in Wiltshire, UK, he came across a Roman mosaic under the ground. He immediately suspected it had historical significance. Irwin alerted archaeologists, who spent eight days unearthing a well-preserved Roman villa that once belonged to a very wealthy family. Experts believe that it may be one of the largest such structures throughout the country, the Belfast Telegraph reported shortly after the excavation. Artifacts found at the site, including oysters that were transported live from the coast in salt water, reflected the family's luxurious lifestyle and abundant wealth. Also included among the finds were coins, jewelry, animal bones, a Roman well, and a casket, which Mr. Irwin had found earlier and was using it to keep geraniums in. He didn't realize it was a small coffin. Researchers compared the villa, which was constructed sometime between 175 and 220 AD, to the Chedworth Roman Villa, one of the grandest known such structures in Britain. Dr. David Roberts, historic England archaeologist, said the find was very significant for a number of reasons. Large Roman villas hold a lot of information and value. The site also contained evidence of pre-Roman occupation, as well as more recent, but still very old artifacts, including 5th century pottery and wooden structures within the villa, leading experts to believe that at some point, a family lacking the resources to properly maintain the property chose to remain there anyway. I was overwhelmed by the realization that someone's lived on this site for 2,000 years, Erwin said. You look out at an empty field from your front door, and yet 1,500 years ago, there was the biggest house, possibly, in all of Britain. Archaeologists hailed the discovery as majorly significant due to its unusually well-preserved state, as well as the presence of artifacts from the region's post-Roman, pre-Saxon period. King Richard III For a long time, no one knew where King Richard III was buried. One day in 2012, an amateur researcher who was interested in finding King Richard III approached experts from the University of Leicester Archaeological Services with the suspicion that the deceased royal was buried in a parking lot. The organization found the claim credible enough to begin excavations, despite being unsure if King Richard III was, in fact, buried beneath the lot, which is also the site of an old church. In an impressive stroke of luck, the team found the correct location of the church and a skeleton on their first try. Suspecting they had found King Richard III's remains, the researchers began a series of tests to confirm the body's identity, including DNA analysis, radiocarbon dating, bone analysis, radiological evidence, and more. Early the following year, the team announced that the skeleton was, indeed, King Richard's. Shortly thereafter, a heated debate ensued about where to rebury his remains, with various politicians, local organizations, and descendants of the king's family weighing in on the controversy. After numerous ensuing legal battles, King Richard was entombed at Leicester Cathedral. King Richard III was the last Plantagenet monarch, ruling for just a few years, from 1483 until his death in 1485. While analyzing his remains, researchers learned that he began drinking a lot more wine and consuming a lavish diet once he became king. Well, obviously, further testing indicated that he died in an attack that involved two strikes to the head bringing his short-lived reign to an untimely end. Alexander's Bathtub Located inside an abandoned palace is a ginormous granite bathtub, but who would need such an enormous tub? Babolovo Palace, also called Babovka Palace, was built as a summer residence and bathhouse toward the end of the 18th century during the reign of Catherine the Great of Russia. It's located about 15 miles south of St. Petersburg in a town called Tsar's Village. The residence was seldom visited and was abandoned in 1791, partially due to its remoteness, and it wasn't until the 1820s that it saw a revival. Within Babolovo Palace is a giant granite bathtub called the Tsar Bath, which was added to the palace during this time under the instruction of Tsar Alexander I. It's rumored that Alexander used the palace and, presumably, the gigantic tub as a rendezvous point for meetings with his lover, a court banker's daughter named Sofia Velo. The tub was reportedly carved from a single 176-ton chunk of granite sourced from Finland, and the task took an entire decade to complete. That's a long time to wait for a bathtub. 
At approximately six and a half feet tall and 17 feet in diameter, the finished product is more like a small swimming pool than a conventional bathtub. It holds around 8,000 buckets of water, and it's one of the few surviving remnants of Babalovo Palace, which was badly damaged during World War II and now sits in ruins. Longyu Caves Deep in China's Zhejiang province lies the village of Longyu, where there are a series of ancient caves that were undiscovered until 1992, when a local man named Wu Anai decided to put a local legend about the town's bottomless ponds to the test. Upon attempting to find out just how deep the ponds were by using a water pump to siphon them dry, he found that they were, in fact, flooded entrances to hand-carved caverns, whose origins remain a mystery to this day. It took 17 days for Wu and I to get to the bottom of the legend, literally, and the ensuing discoveries amounted to 24 caves total, which came to be known as the Long Yu Caves. The cave's walls are adorned with carved lines and symbols of unknown meaning, and that's merely the beginning of the mysteries to be found within. None of the caves are interconnected, yet several of them share extremely thin walls, and given their estimated age dating back to 200 BC, it's amazing that the builders did not puncture them with their primitive tools. Speaking of tools, archaeologists have not found any evidence of the tools that the builders used to construct the caves with, nor are there any signs of what the cave's original purpose was, especially since they're seemingly too large for the population of a small village to construct on their own. In fact, experts estimate that it would have taken 1,000 workers to build the caves in a reasonable amount of time. Great Pyramid Void in November 2017, in what Egyptologist Yukinori Kawei called the discovery of the century, scientists announced the discovery of two previously unknown voids in Egypt's 4,500-year-old Great Pyramid of Giza. Standing at 455 feet tall, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built for Pharaoh Khufu. Scientists with the Scan Pyramids Project reported the discovery of two previously unknown voids in the Great Pyramid in an article published in November 2017 in the journal Nature. There is one void located above a giant passageway that leads to the Grand Gallery and Khufu's burial chamber. Measuring about 100 feet long, its dimensions seem similar to the 153-foot-long, 26-foot-tall tunnel it's situated above. The smaller corridor's length is unclear. At the time the discoveries were announced, scientists were unsure what was inside of it. In January 2018, Live Science reported on researchers' plans to investigate the corridor using tiny robots equipped with high-resolution cameras, thermal imaging, and other advanced detection technology, which they also used to discover the voids in the first place. By doing so, they hoped to learn what the voids were used for. Possibilities include burial chambers and construction passageways, and if there are any unknown contents within or other spaces linked to them. Hopefully, further investigation using muon detectors and thermal imaging will provide answers to the many questions we still have surrounding the pyramids. The next step is to send robots into the void once it is safe enough to do so. Cocaine Mummies some researchers have long speculated for various reasons that the ancient Egyptians crossed the Atlantic and reached the Americas 3,000 years ago. If this were to be true, it would challenge essentially everything we believe about the first people to arrive on the continent after indigenous Native Americans got there. One such piece of evidence pointing toward this possibility allegedly came to Dr. Michelle Lescott from the Museum of Natural History in Paris in 1976 in the form of a sample from the mummified remains of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses the Great. Lescott discovered traces of tobacco on the bandaged remains using an electron microscope, which her colleagues initially wrote off as contamination from modern sources. After all, as things currently stand in the historical record, tobacco was first known to travel to Europe after Columbus traveled to the New World in 1492, 2,700 years after Ramses the Great passed away and was mummified. Years after Lescott examined the tissue sample, forensic toxicologist Dr. Svelta Balabanova followed up on her findings by analyzing a piece of intestinal tissue from deep inside Ramses the Great's preserved body, rather than external samples, reducing the likelihood that the evidence was contaminated. She reportedly discovered traces not only of tobacco, but also of cannabis or marijuana and coca, the plant used for making cocaine, like rings on a tree. Despite her excellent reputation, Balabanova's colleagues, like Lescott, said that this wasn't enough to prove that the ancient Egyptians actually personally handled or used these substances. In 1992, a decade later, seven mummies were flown out of Cairo for further investigation into the matter. Gas chromatography tests of all seven samples conducted by Balabanova indicated the presence of nicotine and coca. 
These findings suggest that the ancient Egyptians either traveled to the New World or traded with people in it. But very little follow-up research has been done on the matter, and researchers are divided on whether or not ancient, far-flung trade routes truly existed. Baigong Pipes Mount Baigong, located in China's Qinghai province, is home to what's called the Baigong Pipes. Local legend speculates that the pipes, which are located inside caves near the mountain, are the site of an ancient extraterrestrial laboratory. Three triangular entrances lead to the cylindrical formations, and on top of the mountain, there's a mysterious pyramid formation. The pipes connect to a nearby lake. All that said, it's understandable why people assume that the pipes are man-made. After all, wouldn't you, at first glance? But the Beijing Institute of Geology dated them back 150,000 years. Based on everything scholars know about human history, it's therefore highly unlikely that humans built the pipes. Unless, of course, you're among the many people out there who are convinced that there is more to our past than science has yet explained. The latter theory is bolstered by the fact that 8% of the pipe's material is allegedly unidentified, according to state-run media organization Xinhua. In 2007, a geology research fellow from the China Earthquake Administration named Zhang Jiandong claimed that the pipes are highly radioactive. Jiang Dong admitted that there is indeed something mysterious about these pipes. But this does not necessarily prove that the formations are man-made. On the contrary, it points toward the possibility that iron-rich magma may have risen from deep in the earth and solidified into the pipe's current shape. Petra Located in southern Jordan and known to its original residents as Ramku, Petra, as Greeks called it, is an ancient, unfinished city and archaeological site in an area that was inhabited as early as 7000 BC. Petra once served as the capital to the Nabataeans, a little understood group of nomadic desert people who archaeologists believe moved there around the 4th century BC due to its proximity to major trade routes. It's nicknamed the Rose City because of the hand-carved caves, temples, and tombs the Nabataeans built into the city's pink sandstone around 2,000 years ago, according to National Geographic. The Nabataeans at Petra profited handsomely from the lucrative incense trade, and the city naturally became their most prominent metropolis. It served as a hub that linked trading caravans between the Mediterranean and Arabian seas, and the Nabataeans prospered for centuries without conquest thanks partially to their clever architecture, as well as their strategic geographical placement, which gave them a lot of control over water sources. Some of the city's most impressive constructions, including a theater that sat 6,000 guests, were built after the Romans arrived in 63 AD. The treasury and monastery, which both boast Hellenistic features, were cut into rock facades from the top down. Simply put, the buildings at Petra are engineering feats, especially for the time during which they were constructed. Included among them was a sophisticated water system consisting of an advanced irrigation tunnel carved into the rock, which supported the city's peak population of around 30,000 inhabitants. After Petra's fall, it was more or less forgotten about until 1812, when Swiss explorer Johann Burckhardt rediscovered it. More recently, in 2016, a still-buried monumental structure was found using satellite imagery. Today, Petra is technically in ruins, but it's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and its stunning beauty continues to draw millions of visitors. Still, researchers know very little about the Nabataeans, who constitute some of its pre-Roman inhabitants. Bazda Caves about 12 miles outside the town of Haran in southeastern Turkey, along a narrow road full of potholes, are the Bazda Caves. From the outside, they're nothing spectacular. One reviewer, Wilco van Herpen, of the Hurriyet Daily News, even recounted that as he approached the cave's entrance, he already wanted to turn around and leave due to the structure's seemingly uneventful nature. What you see when you get out of the car is not impressive at all, Van Herpen wrote. It definitely did not look spectacular. On the contrary, this was horrible, he said, of a small opening leading to some concrete steps. But things got better when the writer realized that he wasn't just in any ordinary cave, but a spectacular one, as he put it. The Bazda Magarasi, or Bazda Caves, are actually a vast ancient rock quarry in an abandoned village. The rocks cut away from Bazda were used to build nearby Haran, and what remains of the quarry has an almost biblical quality to it, with lines and carvings chiseled into it. The Bazda caves are surrounded by roads and tunnels that made it easily accessible to horses and donkeys, and which also make them unique as a very well-organized historical quarry. The largest cave is at least two stories tall, 
and the entrance is big enough for someone to drive an RV through. To keep people from driving in, however, the Turkish government built steps at this entrance, but they also rejected the idea of turning the caves into a recreational area due to the instability of the structures. Archaeologists have dated the caves back to the 13th century based on writings on the wall, but little else seems to be known about them, including how the excavators transported the rock all the way to Haran. Great Wall of Texas In the city of Rockwall, Texas is a rock wall, no kidding, that has perplexed locals and experts alike since farmers discovered it in 1852 while digging a well. The wall appears man-made to many, and that's part of the problem due to its estimated age of between 200,000 and 400,000 years old. Because it dates back so far, many people believe, on the other hand, that the wall is a natural formation, even if it doesn't seem like one. As part of a History Channel documentary, Dr. John Geisman of the University of Texas in Dallas tested samples of the wall. He found that all of the rocks the wall is made out of are magnetized in the same way, indicating that they are, in fact, natural formations rather than deliberately set in place by humans. Of course, despite this, there are believers out there who are set on their vision of the wall as being built by a sophisticated ancient civilization that must have existed in North America long ago. If this were the case, it would challenge our current scientific understanding of the continent's earliest modern humans arriving around 13,000 years ago. And you may be surprised to learn that it's not just conspiracy theorists who have noticed that the wall seems man-made. Most notably, Harvard-trained architect John Lindsay and geologist James Shelton have admitted that the structure has what resemble architectural features, including archways, portals, and window-like square openings. Nero's Bathtub People have been loving their baths for thousands of years and are willing to spare no expense, especially if you are a Roman emperor. Nero's bathtub is made of a type of igneous rock called imperial porphyry, which was highly valued at the time for its purple hue, as well as its hardness, which required sophisticated Roman steel for structuring and shaping. Imperial porphyry also only came from a single mine located in Egypt, making it extremely expensive. It was imported for the wealthiest Romans and such a large piece was practically unheard of. A massive bathtub might sound like an odd or at least rare request, but Alexander I certainly wasn't the only person in history to commission a custom-built model. As a matter of fact, long before Alexander's reign in the year 64 AD, Nero ordered his own giant bathtub. Nero's bathtub isn't just older than Alexander's. At 25 feet in diameter, it's also larger, although it's not deeper. Nero was the youngest known emperor of his time, having come into power 10 years earlier at just 17 years old. Nero is perhaps most notorious for his ruthless tyranny, supposedly playing the fiddle while Rome burned, and the alleged murder of the women in his family, and the alleged poisoning of several members of the Roman Senate whom he saw as obstructions to his power. Today, Nero's bathtub is housed in the Vatican museums and is rumored to be worth about $2 billion. Practically priceless. Kalavantan Durg, India India is home to one of the most incredible abandoned places that you have probably never heard of. The Kalavantan Durg is an abandoned fortress at the very top of a massive mound of earth. Located in Maharashtra, it sits high up in the air, about 2,300 feet above sea level, shrouded in clouds and mystery. Suffice to say, reaching this incredibly perilous abandoned fortress is no easy feat. Climbing to the fortress means trekking up a rock staircase carved into the side of the mountain with thousands of steps. If it's wet, forget about it. This staircase is so steep that one wrong move can send you spiraling to your doom at the bottom of the slope. Called the Climb to Heaven, it attracts many visitors every year who come to visit the historic fort. The climb takes about three hours, but the view is well worth it, surrounded by nature and waterfalls. Built around 530 BC, according to legend, the fort was constructed to honor Queen Kalavantin, or a princess. Now the fort lies abandoned, taken over by greenery, and it does not hold any military significance. Nara Dreamland, Japan What is creepier than an abandoned amusement park? I vote nothing! The first thing that comes to mind when I think of a forsaken theme park is a legion of vagrant clowns with runny makeup and boot knives strapped to their ankles. If that doesn't rouse at least a bit of fear, you are tougher than I am. This abandoned theme park near Tokyo in Japan operated for 45 years, from 1961 until 2006, at which time the brutal competition from Disneyland and Disney Sea put them out of business. Eerily enough, the abandoned amusement park remained standing for over a decade. 
All those quaint theme park streets, brightly painted buildings, and derelict children's rides remained a stark reminder that there is no competition that Disney can't squash. The creator of the park was greatly inspired by Disney, clearly, and even met with Walt Disney himself to see how he could bring the park to Japan. However, towards the end, they disagreed about licensing fees and characters, so the park created their own mascots. When it was abandoned in 2006, everything was left just as it was, and urban explorers have taken amazing images of the park before it was demolished 10 years later at the risk of getting arrested. Photographer Roman Veillon told CNN that he just walked in through the front entrance later on. It seemed like all security guards were long gone. He said that it was amazing walking into the park. The vegetation had really consumed the rides and structures, which transformed the atmosphere. As I walked through the park, I would think about all the good memories that had been made by visitors when it was still open. It makes you almost feel nostalgic. It makes you want to hear the sound of children screaming and families having fun. There was an incredible sense of wonder. Some of the abandoned locations I explore can be quite sad and gloomy, but this was quite joyful and magical. What do you think? Creepy or magical? Would you want to explore an abandoned theme park? Let me know in the comments below. Power Station Belgium Europe can be a pretty spooky place sometimes, especially with all the old crypts and abandoned tunnels you are likely to see on your day tour of Rome or Paris. However, one of the most fascinating abandoned places is located in Monceau sur Sambre, Belgium. Built in 1921, it was one of the largest coal-burning power plants in Belgium. Its massive tower was the main source of energy in the Charleroi area and is said to have been able to cool down 480,000 gallons of water per minute. During the 1970s, new components were even added to the power plant that could also use gas power. The problem was that Plant IM was responsible for 10% of the total carbon dioxide emissions in Belgium, so Greenpeace raised the alarm, leading to its shutdown in 2007. Now the power plant is empty and abandoned, a grim reminder of European industrialization, and there is a giant hole in the ground that looks ready to swallow you whole like some sort of death trap. The hole looks like the beginning of a black hole that leads to the other side of the universe, only it's made of concrete covered in moss. Originally a cooling tower for one of the biggest coal-burning plants in Belgium, this is now a sad concrete graveyard. There are reports of scrap metal looters and security guards, but several urban explorers have made their way inside. Fort Alexander, Russia Fort Alexander is one of the coolest and weirdest abandoned places in the world for many reasons. Located on an island in the Baltic Sea, this bean-shaped fort looks like some sort of prison colony. It was actually used as a research laboratory focused on studying the plague, until some researchers were accidentally infected. It is now nicknamed Plague Fort. It was built in the mid-1800s to guard the gulf near St. Petersburg on a platform of concrete, granite, and sand that sat on the ocean floor. Quite the engineering feat. It could house around 1,000 soldiers and had 360-degree firing capabilities for cannons and artillery. The island was used later on to study other diseases, luckily in isolation, but was shut down in 1917. It was used by the Russian Navy as a storage facility until it was abandoned. Somehow, this creepy abandoned military fortress sash plague lab became the hub of alternative ravers in the 90s. Would you go to a party in this place? Let me know in the comments below. Seems a little too creepy for me. Hashima Island, Japan Hashima Island, located in Nagasaki, also known as Battleship Island, used to be a bustling city full of thousands of coal miners. It might look familiar if you're a James Bond fan like me, as it was used as the inspiration for the villain's lair in the 2012 film Skyfall. Are you a James Bond fan? Which James Bond was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. Today, Battleship Island, which is shaped suspiciously like a battleship in the middle of the ocean, sits completely abandoned off the coast. It is a dark reminder of Japan's brutal labor practices before and during the Second World War. In the 30s and 40s, many workers perished from malnutrition, exhaustion, and unsafe working conditions. The island's notoriety began in 1887 when the underwater coal mines started their operation. In time, the city grew to accommodate thousands of workers and their families. When coal mining declined and closed in 1974, everyone left, leaving the concrete buildings to collapse into rubble. In 2015, it was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Historical Site, but the majority of the island remains off-limits to visitors. Remnants of schools, hospitals, and even children's toys can be seen, left forsaken and ruined apartment buildings. 
It is a testament to the forced laborers and grueling working conditions on the island, as well as the history of industrialization. Tyrone House, Ireland. This great abandoned manor house is a reminder of days gone by. This once prosperous house is now besieged by moss and left vulnerable to Mother Nature. You will find the Tyrone House in Galway overlooking the mighty Atlantic Ocean. This is one of the most beautiful plots of land you could ever hope to afford. The house was originally built in 1779 by Christopher St. George from a prosperous family. The house was designed to reflect the growing Irish passion for beauty and sensitive artistry in domestic residences. With three stories and big windows, no expense was spared. St. George also built Kilcolgan Castle, made after the medieval style. This hidden gem is open as a hotel and is said to be a great place to stay off the beaten path. The house was destroyed by the IRA in 1920 during the Irish War of Independence, when there were rumors that it was going to be used as an infirmary. Years later, when it was purchased by a Georgian society in 1972, it should have been rebuilt, but it never was. The Tyrone House remains completely abandoned to this day, a strong, beautiful husk of an ancient home standing along the coast. It's all alone overtaken by the elements as a sad reminder of what it once was. Baron and Pine Palace, Egypt What is spookier than an abandoned palace? An abandoned palace that is reported to be haunted! Or maybe an amusement park. In Cairo, Egypt, in the Heliopolis suburb, there stands a mansion inspired by the Hindu temple architecture of Angkor Wat in Cambodia and Orissa in India. Built in the early 1900s by Baron Edouard Impine, a Belgian entrepreneur and architect, it is covered by ornate animals and figures. Long abandoned, there are many rumors and stories surrounding this place. The Baron led a tragic life and remains a mysterious figure. His wife is said to have fallen to her death from the main tower, and his daughter, who was mentally ill, also died a few years later. After World War I, the Baron moved to Europe, and by 1952, the house was sold and later abandoned. There are stories that the mirrors appear to be covered in blood and furniture moves without any human touch. And if moving furniture and bloody mirrors are not freaky enough on their own, many people have reported hearing voices crying out in pain late at night, as well as sightings of a woman believed to be the Baron's daughter. Atlas Obscura also reports that in more recent times, the house has been the supposed location of satanic rituals, heavy metal parties, orgies, and animal sacrifices. This is not a palace you want to be spending the night in. Unfortunately, if you were hoping to take a tour of Baron Palace on your next trip to Cairo, think again. This place is closed to the public, although there are hopes that the government will renovate the palace to use it as a conference space. We'll see. Tillamook Rock Lighthouse, Oregon Lighthouses are full of romance and nostalgia, and sometimes terrible tales. Off of Oregon's north coast stands one of the most ominous-looking lighthouses that you'll find anywhere in North America. The Tillamook Rock Lighthouse, nicknamed Terrible Tilly, was completed in January 1881 after 500 days of arduous labor and horrible incidents. The surveyor was swept away. Considering this lighthouse stands on a lone rock that can hardly be accessed, building it was a nightmare. Workers had to contend with punishing weather, great crashing waves, and even a storm that washed away all the tools being used only four months into the lighthouse's construction. Workers starved for weeks as they waited for supplies to arrive. Suffice to say, Terrible Tilly started its life turbulently and violently, but its whole purpose was to save ships from that fate. It comes as no surprise that the lighthouse now stands battered and broken on a stony rock completely abandoned and closed to the public. Lightkeepers were finally assigned, but they would work in short rotations since conditions were so difficult. A great storm in 1934 smashed the lantern room and the light's main lens. Neither was ever properly repaired, and on September 1, 1957, the light was turned off for good. The last lightkeeper turned off the light for good and wrote, I return thee to the elements. Keepers have come and gone, men lived and died, but you were faithful to the end. May your sunset years be good years. Your purpose is now only a symbol, but the lives you have saved and the service you have rendered are worthy of the highest respect. Parole, in the end, was not so terrible. Lake Reschen, Italy In 1946, an entire village in Italy was submerged underwater. Since then, only the steeple of the submerged 14th century church sticks out of the lake. Called Lake Reschen, the artificial lake was made as part of a dam project that would provide the area with electricity. Residents from the town and the valley were forced from their homes prior to the area being flooded. The church is not the only building submerged underwater. There are approximately 163 homes hidden underneath. It is literally an underwater town. In the winter, when the lake freezes, you can walk to the steeple of the church and take photographs. 
This is probably one of the coolest places in Italy for a winter excursion, especially with the magnificent mountain range looming grand in the distance. One spooky thing to note is that local legends claim the church bells can be heard ringing sometimes in the winter. This is a bit unnerving considering the bells were removed before the lake was flooded over 60 years ago. Perhaps they will offer diving tours of the old 14th century town. Bodium Castle, England Built in 1385, this castle is one of the most picturesque in Britain. It is often used as a representation of a perfect English castle. It was created to defend the area against the French in the Hundred Years' War. Before the castle, there was a small fortification on the site, so it has been used as a strategic location for many hundreds of years. The castle became a symbol of strength in the area, but it had many defensive shortcomings. Historians argue about how powerful this place really was, but regardless, the moat and solid entrance give it an imposing appearance. It was besieged by royal forces in 1483 when the owner offended King Richard III, who took it over until Henry VII gave it back. It last saw military action in 1643, but the castle hadn't really been inhabited since the 15th century and had been falling into ruins bit by bit. The castle lay in ruins until about the 19th century when it was finally restored and given to the National Trust in 1925 by its last owner, Lord George Curzon. While the exterior is in pretty good shape, the interior isn't looking so good, but you can go and visit the grounds and the castle remains to admire it and let your imagination run wild. Mantis Shrimp The mantis shrimp is a fierce and complex creature. While they aren't even that big, they pack an enormous punch. There are about 550 species of mantis shrimp, ranging from less than an inch to over one foot. They are insanely strong, and when threatened, mantis shrimp attack with the fastest blow of any predator on the planet. Almost. Even with high-speed cameras, scientists have trouble capturing the strike. This is why zoos don't keep them in aquariums. Not only because they will eat all the animals around, but if they get mad, they will punch and crack the glass. There are two different types of mantis shrimp, smashers and spearers. Smashers will knock their prey unconscious, and spearers will impale their prey with spiky appendages. The mantis shrimp can launch its club at about 75 feet per second, so fast that it actually boils the water around it in the process. The shockwave effectively knocks out its prey cold, even things with shells like clams and snails. Besides these powerful boxing clubs that launch like a spring, the mantis shrimp have some of the most complex set of color receptors of any animal. There's a reason that they are so colorful. The mantis shrimp's bright coloring shines bright against the deep blue waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, which they call home. It helps the different species recognize each other. But if we could see what they see, we'd probably think that they are even more colorful than they appear. Humans have three cones for color reception in our eyes. In contrast, the mantis shrimp has 12 to 16. Scientists estimate that this enables them to see around 10 times more colors than humans, and their eyes can even move independent of each other. It can see many more colors than humans, and multiple parts of their eye view the same point in space. We use two eyes to judge distance, whereas mantis shrimp eyes can do that with just one eye. While you'd think that they need a big brain to process all this information, their eye does most of the work and helps them make quick decisions. The Frilled Shark this shark doesn't look like a typical shark because it has adapted to living life in the deep, dark sea. As some scientists have noted, the frilled shark looks like a creature you would find in a national history museum. Yet it's very much alive in the modern world, which has led people to calling it a living fossil, or a prehistoric shark, both of which are accurate. The frilled shark is named due to its gills that almost look fluffy and go all the way across its throat. Its mouth is pretty terrifying, with 25 rows of backward-facing teeth that look like tridents, about 300 in total. Its bright white teeth attract prey in the dark, so it goes around flashing its teeth, and once something gets closer to see what it is, it's too late. Once something gets grabbed, it's going to have a very hard time getting out. Scientists think that it hunts like a snake, lunging toward its prey, and then it can even eat prey up to half its own size. These sharks are found in depths of around 390 to 4,200 feet, so they are very hard to spot, although they will sometimes go to the surface every so often. It wasn't seen in its natural habitat until 2004, when NOAA scientists caught it swimming on camera. We have a lot more to learn about this shark, and we are still discovering new species. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and let me know your favorite animal in the comments below. Bald Uakari Most primates don't strike us as particularly weird. While they can be intimidating, they're pretty close to humans. But bald Uakaris can be pretty scary looking. 
These South American primates have completely bald heads, hence their name, and blazing red faces. Native to the Amazonian rainforest of Peru, Brazil, and Colombia, they have a long coat of hair that can be reddish brown to orange and typically grow to about two feet long and weigh from four to seven pounds. While their red faces and bald heads are their most obviously weird features, these are not their only distinguishing characteristics. They also have pretty short tails, but this doesn't prevent them from swinging through the forest like a champ. While they may look intimidating in large troops of 30 to 100 monkeys, they are very social and playful, and they prefer to live all together and not spread out around the jungle. Unfortunately, they are quite endangered as they are often hunted and captured for food and to sell. What's more, their habitats are being destroyed by loggers moving through the Amazon, and they don't reproduce very quickly. While they face many challenges, they are not the only ones, as the Amazon is disappearing at an alarming rate, since especially during the global pandemic, loggers are taking advantage that people aren't paying close attention. Tardigrade The tardigrade is one of the most fascinating creatures on the planet. Affectionately called the water bear, since so many people think it's cute, you can only pretty much see them under a microscope. They live just about anywhere, but mostly in damp or wet environments such as in or around lakes. Their diet is based on fluids. They suck juices from algae, moss, and lichens that they get grinding their food with their little teeth. Tardigrades are capable of surviving nearly everywhere, though. Most of the time, they inhabit sedimentary structures on wet rocks and the bottom of deep lakes. But they have made it at temperatures as low as minus 325 degrees Fahrenheit for a few days and as high as positive 300 degrees Fahrenheit for a few minutes. Scientists have been testing its resilience for years, and while it isn't quite immortal or invincible, it seems that tardigrades get pretty close. Believe it or not, these little animals could survive an asteroid crash. They've made it alone in space for a week and a half and even survived after a 30-year freeze, multiplying and leading to new generations thereafter. While they may be tiny, they'll be here long after we're gone. Turtle ants. Scientists estimate that there are somewhere around 1 million billion ants currently on Earth, divided into around 12,000 species. Given their diversity, it's no surprise that there are some that stand out from the rest. But even with this expectation, turtle ants stand out a lot. You can find turtle ants in hot semi-tropical environments such as Brazil in the trees. Scientist Scott Powell has spent a lot of time in the trees studying them, observing that they have a very elaborate caste system, and they use their large shields to protect the colony from predators. They form colonies in tiny cavities in trees often made by wood-boring beetles. The sharp ridge around the edge of their head allows the soldier ant to twist and screw their heads into the entrance from the inside so nobody can come in. Their heads create a plate-like door to block the entrances to the nests. Powell's research has shown that the ants evolved to fit specifically into these kinds of holes and don't do well in other environments. He is trying to further study their turtle-like armor and their role in the ecosystem. Ground Pangolin Most of the time when we think scales, we think reptiles or fish. But the ground pangolin, called temminx or the cape pangolin, is the only creature with scales that is entirely warm-blooded and the only mammal covered with scales, along with other pangolins. Ground pangolins are the most populous species of pangolin in sub-Saharan Africa. Pangolins are one of the most trafficked animals in Asia and increasingly in Africa. Their meat is considered a delicacy, and they are often used in folk medicine. They aren't very fast, and they have huge claws that they use to move rocks and rip up the ground to find termites and ants. They feed exclusively on insects, and because of their diet, they are colloquially called the scaly anteater. But one interesting aspect of this pangolin is that when under attack, they curl up into a spiky, scaly ball that is sure to deter predators. Even worse, they proceed by releasing a terrible-smelling spray. In combination, these two tactics should do the trick. Unfortunately, it's not working against humans. The platypus The platypus's odd appearance has been confusing people for centuries. It has a beaver's padded tail, a rotund body covered with fur, and duck-like features such as a flat-billed face and webbed feet. And they lay eggs! What kind of creature is this? It's a venomous mammal! People thought this animal was a hoax for years. Fossils indicate that ancient platypuses, not platypi as is typically thought, were nearly double the size they are today. When they're swimming, their webbed feet help them paddle around, but this webbing retracts back when they come onto land, revealing their claws. Males possess a sharp, venomous spur on both of their hind feet. This venom shares some of the same properties with reptile venom, but it evolved separately. 
Researchers are slightly perplexed about why the platypus, a docile creature with very few natural predators, needs venom. It's most likely to compete against each other during mating season. Their bills are smooth and pliable and help them look around for food while they're swimming below the surface. In fact, it's one of the only things that helps them do so, because their eyes are closed underwater. You won't be able to find the platypus anywhere except Australia, and even then, usually at night. They are nocturnal, sleeping for up to 14 hours a day. While they were once hunted for their fur, these strange creatures are now thankfully protected by the Australian government. Koreatonotus ganges A few years ago, a video went viral of an enormous moth that looks like it has tentacles growing out of its back. Or like a moth getting attacked by a centipede or something, like pulsating back legs. This thing looks like something out of a horror movie, but it's actually real. This creepy crawly is called the Kreatonotus ganges, which hails from Australia, naturally, and Southeast Asia. It doesn't always look like that. In general, it's just a regular moth with black and white wings and a red or yellow body. But when it's in the mood for love, this moth sends out four tentacle-like scent glands called corimata and inflates them in order to send pheromones in the hope of attracting a mate. This gives it an alien appearance, but this action is actually harmless. It's just a regular creepy moth with tentacles. No biggie. Not only do these moths have strange mating behaviors, they have odd eating habits as well. When they're caterpillars, they feed on plants filled with toxic chemicals, which evolved to prevent being eaten by bugs. However, the Creatonotus ganges actually requires these chemicals in order to survive. So even though they won't harm you, whoever eats them is in for a toxic snack. Ribbon worm. The ribbon worm is perhaps the strangest worm you can find. There are more than 1,000 species of ribbon worms that can be found mostly in the ocean, and they are infamous for their method of attacking victims. Inside their bodies is an odd muscle structure called a proboscis, which acts like a feeding tube. While attacking their prey, they compress themselves and shoot the structure from inside. The proboscis usually discharges a paralyzing sticky substance that renders its prey immobile. These kinds of ribbon worms employ tetrodotoxin. Not only does this poison help ribbon worms attack, but it also deters other animals from eating them. Given the variety of ribbon worms, it makes sense that there would be a variety of proboscis as well. Most are sticky with liquid or suction-like appendages, but others have a more violent method of attack. In particular, the Hoplanomertea have a spike on their muscular structure, which they then use to stab their victims. And when they lose one of these spikes, they make replacements and keep them on reserve inside of their body. Also, they vary greatly in size. They are super stretchy, and scientists have found some that are nearly a hundred feet long, and some are thought to be double that length, although they are very difficult to measure. Viperfish The viperfish is one of the strangest looking creatures in the world. Not only that, but it is also one of the deadliest predators in the very deep sea. Because they are so fast and live in such a harsh environment, very few have ever been spotted. But of those we have seen, the images are striking. You can identify the viperfish by its gaping jaws and long fangs. Their teeth are so big that they don't entirely fit into their mouths, curving outside of their jaws and coming close to their eyes. These teeth come in handy because the viperfish doesn't grow to be that big, maxing out at around one foot long. Instead, the fish's great speed, in combination with their sharp, long fangs, enables them to stab their prey with great force. They are generally dark creatures, so dark they blend in with the dark depths around them, although they can be green, blue, and silver. At the end of their long spine atop their head is a bioluminescent lure that glows just like anglerfish. So any unsuspecting creature that gets too close is in for a nasty surprise. Thanks for watching! Have you ever seen any of these animals? Which one is your favorite? Let me know in the comments below! Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already! See you soon! Bye!